Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 115, It's in the Cards. Tabletop RPGs that use standard playing cards to play and card-based adventure board games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live every Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We're back after a slightly longer than expected break. Tonight, we've got someone looking for role-playing games that use a standard deck of playing cards. Now, sticking with that topic of cards and adventure games, our two reviews tonight are going to be card-driven games based on popular role-playing games. We'll be finishing up with a mix of games for our weekend review, including two first plays, first impressions of Mission Red Planet and Bricks and Brutes. The other thing you'll notice tonight is that we have tweaked our format quite a bit. More about that in the net up next in the suggestion box. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment on top 10 trick-taking games. Ask the Bellhop segment on YouTube. Justone4 writes, Hey, found the channel on MeWe. Also followed your Twitch channel, Awesome to see Extra Life donations. I donate to Extra Life as well. Hope to see some more videos and catch you live on Twitch sometime. Thanks for the answers about Galaxy Trucker on MeWe. Oh, thank you very much for the comment and great to hear about someone else raising money for Extra Life. I wanted to include this particular comment as it makes for good reminder that we are still accepting donations for our personal Extra Life efforts, our Windsor Gaming team. Uh, We'll be collecting money until the end of the month, the end of December, and technically we'll be collecting it in January again for next year, but I'm probably not going to register that early. But we are still trying to raise money for our 2020 efforts. Uh, You can still make a donation by heading to WindsorExtraLife.com and click on the donate now button it's up on the top right near the top of the page now falk Rutsch also commented on the same topic of trick-taking games with trick-taking is my favorite card game genre didn't recognize a decline though i love texas showdown well thanks for the comment falk um i gotta wonder where falk is because everyone we talked to about that topic at the time in our chat room and people we've talked to in person have seen a decline in traditional card game play in their area. Though I gotta say, if where Falk is is still playing Euchre and other trick-taking card games, that's cool to hear that like traditional games are still being played somewhere. Now, I did take a look into Texas Showdown. It's not one I knew of off the top of my head, and I gotta say, this sounds solid. This is a trick-taking game where the entire point is to never take any tricks, to take as few as possible. Now, I play games where you may not want every trick or not taking any for one player is like a shoot the moon thing, but I don't think I've ever played a game where the goal of every player sitting at the table is to take no tricks. That sounds pretty cool to me. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking this one out. I've been, I don't know if it's still in print or not, but what I will do is toss a link when I find out in the show notes. Well, next, a comment from Brian McDonald on our must-have gaming accessories article. Great article, Mo. I love my component collectors, and I swear by neoprene mats when you can get them. I picked up a custom neoprene last year for War Chest, and it's perfect. Thanks for the comment, Brian. Now, Brian McDonald is the man behind the Brains on Games YouTube channel. Uh, That's a channel that covers games from the perspective of learning. Uh, He's actually a a licensed psychologist, and he's taking a look at games with a, a very different perspective than, say, you get from Sean and I. When you get a chance, I do suggest you check out uh, this fellow Canadian's channel. Brian's up in Ottawa, so a little far away from us, but still showing the Canadian pride. Now back to Brian's comment, component collectors. I'm assuming he's talking about the ones from Dogmite Games. These are wooden, various shaped trays of different sizes that are magnetic that you can put together in different patterns that were uh, kickstarted. And I got to admit, that's one I have FOMO on. Or not FOMO, I did miss out. It's not fear of missing out. I actually missed out on. And I got to say, they looked really cool. Like they, I love the concept of being able to buy different sets and customize them for which game you're playing. So you have like one tray for meeple and one tray for resources, another tray to hold your pencil or whatever. As for neoprene mats, I totally agree. Um, for the games I own that have them, I love them. So I do have to say in general, I do tend to stick to the shelf liners, which we've recommended many times, mainly just due to the cost, right? Like I get the shelf liners at the dollar store. You're not going to find a dollar neoprene mat. 
but a specific mat for a game I'm a huge fan of. And I got to say a war chest mat, that would be awesome. One of my main complaints about war chest is actually the board. I um, hate the way the goals are round to get covered by the pieces. I wish those goal tiles were brighter and I would love to see a neoprene mat with those highlighted better. I, I'm going to have to try to get a hold of Brian. I don't know if he's listening or if he is, and I forget to actually contact him on social media. I'd love to know where you got that, Matt. Well, during the downtown downtime, we also received some constructive feedback on our overall show. Yeah, that's right. We always said that we appreciate your comments, both positive and negative. And over the last few weeks uh, during our downtime, I did get actually a handful of comments about various different parts of the show and things we could do to improve them. Now, we sat down, Sean, Deanna, and I on the weekend, and we took all of these suggestions to heart, and tonight's format change is actually um, a result of a rather long discussion the three of us had on what we can do to tweak the show and hopefully make it a little tighter uh, and more succinct. Now, honestly, it's far harder to not know if what we're doing is working or not than to take criticism for our work. While we can't please all of the people all of the time, we've made changes in the past based on feedback, and we're happy to do so again. Yeah, we did make a, a number of changes tonight. I'm sure you've already noticed some of them. Uh, but there are some things we decided to keep the, the same. Like uh, someone was strongly suggesting we no longer do the Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton joke. And I'm sorry, that's been here since episode one. That one's not going away. That's one that comes up on Facebook and social media and even in-person gaming. So that, that's a running gag you're going to have to just put up with. Sorry. <laughs> As always, the main thing we would like to know is what you think of the changes or even the parts unchanged. Yep. We think we've changed things for the better, but maybe we went too far or not far enough. Yeah, I'll admit it'll probably take us a couple episodes for us to get used to the new flow, though actually it's already going better than I thought it would. I figured there's some spots we'd stumble over. There was one bit I almost went a little longer than I meant to. But yeah, let us know what you think. That's it for this week's comment. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Just one quick announcement this week. All right, besides the fact we're back from a three-week hiatus and ready to get things back on schedule, the only thing I want to announce tonight is the winner of our Animal Empire giveaway. And that honor goes to Pete D. Now, I got to say, I am glad to see Pete win because Pete has got to be the most diligent content entrant we've ever had. One of the ways you could enter this contest and almost every contest we've ever had was that you could send a tweet and that was a repeatable entry you could do every day. So you could go in and just tweet a little thing that says tabletop bellhops giving away animal empire, enter here. And every day I would get up and log into tweet deck in the morning or afternoon. If I slept in, I would see Pete's tweet sharing the contest. So congratulations, Pete, for winning and for helping us spread the word about the contest. Well, thanks to everyone who stops by and catches us live. All right. Um, I want to thank everyone who showed up tonight in the lobby, our chat room. Tonight, we're going to be talking about card-driven games. Uh, first off, RPGs, uh, specifically pen and paper, tabletop role-playing games that use standard playing cards. And then later when we get into the reviews, we're going to be talking about some card-driven adventure board games. Now, Sean and I have, I think we're up to 13, maybe 14. We have, we have a handful of RPGs we're going to be talking about. I got to say, this one's a little bit of outside our wheelhouse, right? This is something that no way are Sean and I are experts in. We have not played all of the card-driven RPGs out there. So it'd be great if you folk in the lobby can help us point out any games we may have missed. All right. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Today's topic comes from Sewer Rat Zero, who wrote to say, RPG-type games using playing cards would be an interesting topic I would love to hear you cover. Oh, thanks for the great topic, Sewer Rat Zero. Also great username. Uh, so again, this is going to be an interesting one for us to cover. This one's going to be a little different than probably any topic we've completely covered in the past. Um, the reason for that is at this point in my gaming life, I have only actually played one RPG that uses standard playing cards. So this is an interesting one for me. I don't think, Sean, have you played anything that's... Yeah, I didn't think so. Sean's not played anything that uses standard playing cards as a mechanism. So this was a question outside of our, our general area of expertise. And we did a lot more research than usual on this one, trying to find out about different games that people out there are excited about. 
Now, thankfully, the internet is full of other people yep. who have asked this question with varying degrees of success, and we stand on the shoulders of those Reddit and Board Game Geek threads that inspired uh, our research. Yeah, I agree. The, we definitely do have to thank um, various forums, blogs. I was on RPG Net, I, Board Game Geek, and Reddit were, of course, or technically RPG Geek, though I know they're all the same same uh, suite of sites. Um, this was an interesting one with a, with a lot more research gone into it, and it um, it was cool to find the information out there. And hopefully in next year at this time, someone will do this research and find us. So consider this an aggregate of all the information we were able to find out on the web. Now, the other thing that's important here, of course, is except for that one game I mentioned that I have played, uh, we played none of these games. So nothing we're talking about tonight will be games that are... Um, we have personal experience with these are very well regarded guarded by a number of fans it's not like we saw the game come up on one list and threw it on the list here uh we tended we tended we trended tended isn't the right word we chose games <laughs> that uh multiple people were talking about but again we don't have any personal experience so the following games are all pen and paper tabletop RPGs that use a standard deck of playing cards during play. Now, for most of these, the deck of cards is all you need to play, but there are a couple exceptions once we get into the list. And with that, let's get on to our list. All right. Up first, I'm going to have to call out the one game system I know and have played that uses playing cards, and that is Savage Worlds. Uh, and technically, I realize Deadlands as well, because Savage Worlds is an evolution of Deadlands. Now... Savage Worlds is a generic role-playing system. Uh, it's all about playing fast, furious fun. That's their, their three Fs, their tagline for Savage Worlds. This is a high-action, pulpy, adventure-style game where lots of things are going to happen quickly. And the thing with this game, where it's so-so on this list, is it is a dice game. Uh, you have your stats and you try to roll under four on your dice and, or sorry, over four, over four on your dice to succeed at things. That's the main mechanic, but it does use playing cards, a standard deck during initiative and also during adventure downtime. So during initiative, it's pretty simple. Everyone just gets dealt out a card, but the neat part is if there's a joker, the deck gets shuffled. Plus usually something exciting happens if a joker is dealt out. Plus some of the rules also have it so that if you get like a face card, it does something extra. The other neat one is during downtime. So if between the adventure, your party sitting around the campfire, you flip a card and then someone at the party in the group has a story and the card that's flipped tells you what type of story you should tell. Now, in addition to that, that's just the original core rules. Savage Worlds being a universal system has numerous different settings out there. Like you can get Robotech, you can get Rifts, you can get uh, Rippers, which is like a Jack the Ripper, Victorian, Victoriana style game. There are all kinds of Savage Worlds games out there. And every one tends to have something special using the cards. Well, I admit I've glanced at uh, Savage Worlds for its ability to play supers mm. a few times, and I do like the idea of card-based initiative especially. Um, that's something that I, I think is just a great tool for the table. Mm -hmm. Now, what I have heard is that it's a system that's much harder on the DM than the players, uh, and managing the, the different ability levels and power levels of things during that game can be a real... Uh, struggle, but it does use cards, and that is Savage Worlds. Next up, I have The Quiet Year. Um, this one has been categorized by people a couple times, different ways. Some people classify it as a board game. Some people classify it as a role-playing game. Actually, it's one of the few things that has two entries on Board Game Geek, one on Board Game Geek and on RPG Geek. It's listed on both. Um, this is a game like Microscope. Microscope would be an RPG that I'm familiar with, that this reminds me of, where the group, the players, are collaboratively building a world. Now, this is also called a map game because as you're building the world, you're drawing a map of your area. And what's happening here is there was a huge war and it just ended. There's a time of peace and you're about to have one year of peace, a quiet year. And you're going to explore the struggles of the post-apocalyptic community during that year. Now, what I like about this, uh, at least from what I could read about it, is that unlike pretty much every post-apocalyptic game out there that's all about super mutants and shooting things and trying to survive and getting happy about a can of beans, this focuses on building something good during that quiet year. 
Now this uses a full deck of cards, a 52 card deck. And what's cool is there's 52 cards and there's 52 weeks in the year. So you're going to use the cards as prompts for each week of the quiet year. Now I have to say the website for this game was a bit lacking in the kind of detail I wanted to make a real choice on, on whether or not I wanted to play this game or not, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm still not 100% sure I understand this game after looking it over. Uh, now, the one thing that is interesting on the, on the site is they do have a breakdown of what every card in the deck means. Okay. Uh, so you can actually go through and see, you know, uh, an Ace of Spades means you uh, have to take a break. And so you actually take the two top deck cards off your deck lose them and what you're doing this week happens for three weeks instead things oh, like wow. that ha happen it's 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 some there's some really interesting mechanics but the game states two to four players and i i'm not really sure why based on what i was able to read you couldn't play solo uh if uh, based on what i read so if any listeners have experience with this system i'd love to hear more about it uh and again that is the quiet year through the Breach is a pen and paper RPG set in the world of Malifaux. Um, Malifaux isn't a game we've talked about often on the show. It's not one I played, but it, this is a, it started off as a miniature skirmish war game. Um, one of the games that came out around the time Rackham came out with Confrontation that has some of the best looking, coolest miniatures I've ever seen. They kind of took the gaming industry by storm. Now, Malifaux as a brand has expanded out since the miniature game and has a couple different board games and now this RPG through the breach. Now this is a really cool looking setting that like what's going to draw you to Malifaux is the aesthetic. It's a steampunk mythos magic mashup but very dark very like twisted magic demons summoning a really dark take on steampunk compared to what you usually see now in through the breach players are taking on the role of the fated which are men and women who have caught a great brief glimpse of their destinies now again like sean said online some of the websites on these games are great at selling the the setting not so great on selling the mechanics so i have to admit i have no idea how the cards actually work in this one but man does the setting look cool well this one really caught my eye as the fleeting nature of the professions actually in particular mm. and the extend the intriguing and expansive setting uh i got a real steampunk meets warhammer fantasy mm -hmm. battle vibe from it and that is a good thing. <laughs> yep. You know, that's the sort of thing that will sell me on something. Uh, and that was Through the Breach. Up next, we have Murderous Ghosts. Now, this is billed as a one-shot for two or more players. And right away, that caught my attention, because it's not often you find an RPG that plays good with only two players. So right there, it gets some bonus points. I noticed The Quiet Year was another one that also did two players, so we don't earn some bonus points in retrospect. Now, the goal of Murderous Ghosts, this is a game for two or more players to play on Halloween, specifically, is what it's designed for. It's uh, inspired by the tradition of sitting around telling ghost stories, and the goal is to creep each other out. There is no prep required for this. You just turn to page one of the book and start doing what it says. Uh, it's got a kind of choose your own adventure style format. Together, the players are telling the tale of an urban explorer deep inside a haunted abandoned hotel. Now there is an MC, a DM type role in this game where the MC is playing the ghost who is trying to kill the explorer. Now the other players all act as a panel controlling the actions of the explorer. So in a panel system, it's multiple people are controlling one character, which is why this game works great at two. Uh, this one is from Vincent Baker himself, uh, half of the team behind the entire Apocalypse World Engine stuff. Now, I am not a horror fan. Not a big deal. But if you want to get my intention, if you include this in your preview, <laughs> they actually had in the uh, one of the first pages of the book the uh, a, a win-lose which is odd for an RPG in, in the first place. You know, winning and yep. losing is something we, we generally kind of avoid in RPGs. But this yep. one had, you win if, you win if, you lose if your ghosts aren't murderous, if the <laughs> other players stop trying to escape and instead help a ghost find peace and its eternal rest, you lose. And that was Murderous Ghosts. All right, up next, I have Unbound. Uh, this is another universal role-playing system. I guess universal role-playing systems like to use universally accessible playing cards. Uh, what sets this one apart 
from other universal systems I've seen is that you sit down to play or you're expected to sit down and play. I'm sure some groups sit down without this, but you're expected to sit down with your group for the first time with Unbound with no pre-existing idea of what you're going to be playing. The players create more than character during character generation. You create the world, uh, the setting, and the adversaries all during like a session zero, all through using a series of leading questions. Now, the other thing that I saw that seems to, uh, that Unbound seems to stick out for, that they seem very proud of, I got to say, because they, they talk about this a lot, is a highly detailed zone-based tactical combat-based system. They really push this. Now, this isn't a story game, as far as I can tell. This is not a rules light, single session, sit down and tell a story with a deck of cards. This is quite a crunchy RPG designed for running longer games and campaigns, not just quick one shots. Yeah, this one is interesting. And I 100% respect the incredible work that they've done on, their, on this system. Uh, in the end, though, it's just not for me. Uh, and the main reason of that is they've put so much into this card-based tactical system that you can play anything as long as it has combat. It is very specifically detailed as a combat-oriented gaming system. And while there's nothing wrong with combat, the fact that you require combat to have this to play this game system puts me off a tiny little bit. But fair enough. That is Unbound. Up next, we have the Western RPG one. I actually own Aces and Eights from Kenzer Co. Uh, this is one of the few lists games on the list that I have downstairs in my game room. And I watched the development of this game through Kenzer Co. back when I subscribed to Knights of the Dinner Table. This is a, a monthly comic book that also had RPG content in the back by all about a uh, group of gamers and the local gaming community. And at one point during the comic book run, they decided to run what they called a cattle punk game. And they played through this cattle punk game. And that story arc was so popular that everyone pushed Kenzer um, to publish the RPG that the characters and the thing made and that's where Aces and Nates came from and it was meant to be and still stands as one of the most dense detailed Old West settings out there uh, and this is realistic Old West like uh, realistic as you get with a role-playing game but not there's no fantasy elements this isn't Deadwood there's no zombies this is you it is as far as according to the website the only website only Western game that actually includes rules for things like cattle rustling and and all doing cowboy stuff that's not just shooting each other similar to Savage Worlds that I mentioned earlier the main system of this game is dice based. It's it's a, a, a traditional, you know, skill based roll dice, add your skills and stats. Where the cards come out is in a couple different systems. The big one though is their combat system, their gun shooting system, their, their gunfight system, which actually uses a shot clock. Now this actually uses a transparent template that you put over shadows of your enemy's pictures. And the book includes a whole bunch of different shadows for, you know, someone behind a cow, someone on a horse, someone running a stagecoach. And you put the shot clock over top and then you draw cards and you play a can of cards to show where your shot lands. A really unique system. Um, the other thing is they actually have a simulated poker system where you play shorter poker hands of poker to simulate a full poker game, again, using poker cards. So which again, poker being a huge part of the old West setting. Uh, this is the crunchiest game on the list. Unfortunately, my copy is literally still in shrink wrap downstairs. Like I, I thought this sounded awesome, but it's intimidating and thick. And I had a real hard time trying to sell my players on, you were going to play cowboys. You're going to be rustlers. Like, oh, are we going to get to do this, this, and this? And like, no, no, you're going to have to bring the wagon train home. And they're like, that doesn't sound like fun to me. And I'm going <laughs> to say, I, I, I'm going to have to lend them the comic books so they can read them. And then maybe they'll be like, oh, that does sound good. Yeah, now... I am not, nor have I ever been a Western fan, uh, even more so than horror, really. The genre just never worked for me. But if you are a Western fan, this game really seems like something you should check out. As yeah. it's one of the few, perhaps only, campaign games mm -hmm. for the Western theme. Uh, as long as you don't mind the fiddly shot clock mechanic. Uh, I, I watched a YouTube video. Yeah, and, it's... And, and I mean, it was an eight-minute video on how to use the shot clock. It, not, not that it needed to be that long, but it's a little over crunchy than compared <laughs> to what it needs to be. But that was Aces and Eights.
Now, on the theme of Westerns, despite the fact that I just said I'm not a fan, I came across an old gem that you can still get your hands on over on Drive-Thru RPG, and that is Dust Devils. This one caught my eye, not only because pen, paper, and playing cards and poker chips are the only things you need to play, but because the mechanics of poker are also part of the okay. resolution system in the game, which is so deliciously thematic for a Western uh, and it even matches up your stats to the sweets in your uh, in a deck of cards. And the GM is the dealer. Uh, I dig it. I remember hearing about this one. I, I this isn't one that I came across when I was doing my research. And I gotta say, like I recognize the name. Like I remember Dust Devils. I don't know if it's a Kickstarter. Or I remember Buzz going around it. It does sound cool, and it does sound a heck of a lot simpler than trying to get through that thick Kenzerco book. Yeah, that was it was two thousand and uh, two thousand and two indie game of the year. Nice. No. And that was Dust Devils. Talking about games on Kickstarter, here's one I actually did kickstart, Moto Bushido. Uh, this is back in 2013. I only backed at the PDF level. Um, this, The concept of this one is bike riding samurai. And that alone, right there, I'm like, samurai on bikes, that just sounds cool. Now, this game is from NPC, uh, Nathan Philip Cole probably best known as one of the hosts of the bikers dice and bars podcast um who was extremely active on google plus back in the day and i honestly i backed this because i got along with npc really well this was in order to support him and he did a great job summer summing up this game to me and this is what sold it right away was moto bushido is a game about really sweet duels between really cool samurai who read ride really awesome motorcycles it's sons of anarchy starring toshiro mifun underscore by Bushido Blade. I right there, I was sold. The cover of this game looks amazing. All resolution in Motor Bushido is done using standard deck of cards, and it has a separate wing subset that again uses a standard deck of cards. Yeah, I mean, it's about a game about death and dying with swords and motorcycles where death is inevitable and not to be feared. Yeah. Um, it's how can you go wrong? The basic resolution is just a high card yeah. wins between the dealer and the players. But then this dueling system that they've got involves hands of cards. And even if only one player is dueling an NPC, the entire team, the entire table becomes involved in playing mm -hmm. it out. Uh, and there are, there, you know, there are, um, you can, you can dirty your soul by the way you fight your, your, yep. your games. It's, it's a really intriguing game. Uh, and uh, the fact that he uses cards is just a bonus. And that is Moto Bushido. Yeah, the deep, the dirty your soul thing. I remember when that came out in um, what was a uh, katana? Yeah, that that card dueling game where if you draw blood, you'd actually dirty your soul and and dirty your um, your kami. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic sounding game. I've read this one. I haven't played it. it. That this is one I got the PDF. I read through the PDF. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. But another one that just my my group likes, you know, traditional D and D <laughs> dungeon crawling and yep. selling them on on, on and uh, swords and <laughs> on, on motorcycle. So it didn't go over so well. I have a different group now, though. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll go over a little better now. So we've mentioned a couple older games. If you want to really look back, I am going to throw out the oldest game on this list, something I have held in my hands and seen a number of times, but never actually like picked up and read. And that is Castle Falkenstein uh, by Mike's Pondsmith and R. Telsorian Games. Uh, that's the company most people know from Cyberpunk, especially nowadays, uh, who just released the Cyberpunk Red. Uh, this is a playing card driven RPG. This has been around since 1994, proving that using cards for conflict resolution is definitely not just a new story game thing. Although... Castle Funkenstein is quite a bit of a story game, especially for the time period it came out. Uh, this is a steampunk fantasy role-playing game. So you're looking at steam-powered, um, you know, tanks and, and a steam-powered sidearm kind of thing fighting against dragons and elves. It's, it's an interesting mashup. It is considered by many to be one of the first story games, right? Where the focus was on narrative and lighter mechanics versus crunch and combat and resource management. And honestly, I feel bad for all the years this game's been around. Like I've seen it at so many game stores. I've seen it in discount bins. I've seen people playing it at cons. This is one I've never actually played myself. And, and we're definitely not talking about the GURPS version of well, <laughs> Castle Falkenstein. <laughs> Yes, that's the same setting. It's the same, same, same everything else, but that one uses dice. Yep. 
All right, up next, I have a game I had to put on the list because of the what it's based on, the legends it's based on. And this is Monkey, the role-playing game. And Sean or Deanna found this one. As soon as they said it, I'm like, oh, is this based on the Monkey King? And sure enough, it is. Uh, this is based on the Chinese mythological character, the Monkey King, uh, who's got his staff and his crown, and he rides a cloud around um, from the classic myth, The Journey to the West. Players play out of grace immortals, so fallen gods, seeking redemption by escorting the monk Trupataka to India. I am a huge fan of the Monkey King character. I love the myth. I've seen various versions of Journeys of the West over the years. Uh, if you want to see one of the best Monkey Kings ever, um, Donnie Yen, who known as Ip Man or whatever, does a, a Monkey King movie where he's fantastic. Uh, this, th The fact there's an RPG for this, this is one of those things I'm like, oh my God, there's a Monkey RPG. I, I want the game already. This uses two decks of cards, one for the GM and one for the player. So fits perfectly on this list. Yeah, I really enjoy how the character creation of your immortal is incorporated into the first first play session rather than as a separate aspect at all. Um, and uh, it, again, you know, you, you can't go wrong with the mythology. And that was Monkey, the role-playing game. And just as a side note, worth watching is New Tales of Monkey on Netflix. If you want the Journeys of the West combined with Hercules slash Xena style TV, that's what that is, because it's it's about as corny and silly as Xena and Hercules, but it's the Monkey King story told almost in full. So it, it it's it's campy and a little silly, but I really enjoy it. Up next, the final game on our list is going to be Primetime Adventures. This is when you turn on Netflix and you put on uh, New Legend of Monkey and you're like, man, this would be a great RPG. But you can't find Monkey the role-playing game. So you're like, oh, what would I use to play this? Well, Primetime Adventures is all about playing TVs, dramatic TV series with, with ensemble casts, right? This is all about character growth, personal drama, spanning any setting. Now, interestingly, it starts off like a writer room with a brainstorming session where the group together will decide what kind of show they want to play out. One player will take on the role of producers. Other players play the protagonist in the show. Now, to fit the um, background, campaigns are broken into either five or nine session seasons meant to emulate your standard TV seasons. Resolution mechanics dead simple with players drawing cards based on their traits and looking for red cards. So nice and simple. You're just, how many reds do you have? You're trying to get more reds in your hand than your opposition. I can't think of a lighter, simpler use of playing cards. Yeah, it's interestingly, the first edition of the game, you still use dice. Uh, and it wasn't until the second edition that they switched it over to a card mechanic. Um, again, yes, the, the the straightforward mechanic is just fantastic. And what's interesting is the number of cards you draw to see how many successes mm -hmm. you get is based on your screen presence. So each episode, certain characters will take a leading role yep. and get a higher screen presence from one to three, whereas other characters who might have you know had a, a larger role in other episodes will step back some and, and have less cards to use as a result. And that was Primetime Adventures. All right, that's it for our list of RPGs that use standard playing cards. Now, while doing the research for this, Sean happened to find, I was a Reddit thread or a board game geek, geek list or something. I can't remember which it was, but it was something neat. It was a list of solitaire playing card RPGs. Now, I gotta admit, I don't know if you want to consider solitaire RPGs role-playing games or uh, just solitaire or board games or whatever. That's up to you. You can decide on your own what you want to think of that. But I thought this was a really neat thing. And there was like a ton of games on this list from what I remember. It was huge. Uh, there were yeah. actually uh, 157 games wow. See? on the list. Now, while there were a number of them, these three really struck uh, struck out as interesting to me. And I have, because I have to say, the dividing line between RPG, solo RPG, and just a different type of solitaire card game is very narrow. Right. So this, uh, the first one is Dungeon Crawl. Now this one is really teetering on that knife's edge of being a fancy solitaire game. Uh, but it has character classes, player stats, and monster stats, all part of the game. So you've got a deck of, uh, deck of cards, pen and paper, you can have a solo roguelike dungeon crawl all of your own with just this one game. 
So is this a, a like, is this something you can just free to play? Like you, yep, you just go online, it's, it's find actually, the rules. It's actually instructables is where I, is where the, oh, uh, the link brought me to, to. So yeah, we'll make sure to throw a, a link to that in the show notes. And you know what, for the people in the chat, we've already got people like, go like, Ooh, this looks interesting. Yep. We'll throw that in the chat room as well. So do you level up when you're going through, or is it like the cards become a choose your own adventure story? Yeah, it's well, it's it's uh, basically you're 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 trying not to die. It's uh, dungeon roll is another one that was sort of gave me okay. a sort of similar feel um, yep. uh, uh, to this. So, and that was dungeon crawl. Uh, next up, we have shooting party. Now, this is a Jane Austen esque romance thievery solitaire game. Okay, uh, you're playing a young thief who has talked their way into a fancy hunting weekend and is trying to get one of the female guests alone in order to talk her out of her jewels. <laughs> that has got to be one of the most unique solitaire themes I've ever heard. Uh... <laughs> now, it, I think with a standard deck of playing cards, it's a little bit of a painted on th pasted on theme, but right. they do have some fantastic print and play uh, cards available that are much okay. more thematic on the in the Jane Austen sort of sense, and actually quite beautiful as well. Again, rules free, or is this something you'd have to purchase? Nope, you can uh, download Again. it on uh, for the, the files are available on Board Game Geek. Oh, very cool. <laughs> that was shooting the shooting party. And now, last one is, and again, this is freely available. For all the files are available on Board okay, Game cool. Geek. Uh, Slasher. Now, this is not for kids or the faint of heart. You are trying to become a legendary horror icon and racking up a large body count while evading the police and moving through the neighborhood. <laughs> and the way this one uses cards, it actually uses miniatures and dice and a, and a character sheet as well. Um, but it's, uh, they use the deck as the layout of the neighborhood where uh, black cards refer to houses with their lights off. Okay. Uh, red cards have lights on and there's different effects and you can, you can actually even collect uh, items and for your inventory throughout. <laughs> Sounds very interesting. So this time you're playing the the, the hunter, right? Like you, the you are playing you're, you're the, the killer. Yes. So this is the opposite of Final Girl. I keep a, where I am in podcast world right now, which is still behind, but I'm getting closer. Everyone's talking about Final Girl, which is this game where you play the final girl who ends up defeating the monster at the end of the slasher film. So this this would be if you want if you if you want the opposite end, <laughs> since something you can play on your own, you can try slasher. Well, that's it for our discussion on RPGs that use standard playing cards. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if in our chat room has anything to add. All right. I saw a couple go by. I think there's some playing card based RPGs that the lobby mentioned that we should check out there. Yeah, so Danielle, we... uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a while since we've seen you. It's good to see you out again. Has mentioned a couple there. So Robert Turk makes games that use standard card decks. Uh, he's got both Purgatory House and Starship Infernum with okay. blackjack systems for challenges, and the cards randomize the room's events you face. Sounds um, cool. And additionally, he's working on a new one that should be in beta soon, which is called uh, Goblonia. Goblonia. I thought he had to say that's something I should eat or run away from. <laughs> now, now uh, Danielle mentions that she has actually played the uh, One Quiet, the quiet Night. Year? The Quiet Year, sorry. Um, and I'm just wondering what makes that a game that you, that you need two players for, uh, if you, uh, it's been a while, she says, but again, it's 2020, so it's been a while for everyone to play everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you, at least you've played it. Whereas, uh, I was just trying to suss out the system by, uh, by reading a website, which was less than ideal. Uh. Other than Sweet. that, all uh, of the games we were talking about tonight were games that use a standard deck of cards, not necessarily only a standard deck of cards. There are a few there that also require dice or whatever. Yep. But... And she's mentioning that, uh, yes, the, the in Goblonia, you actually play goblins. Okay. That, that, <laughs> there you go. It actually, yeah, yeah. Into the name. there's some good games out there for playing goblins, yeah. especially yeah. as long as they're silly goblins. I like playing silly goblins. Murder is kind of creepy. So, so for quiet year, you're building a world. So I guess you just need that interaction in order to, to yeah, like, uh, build things up, playing off each other. Off each more other. Interesting. Yeah. So I guess so I you, suppose in theory, you probably could, but you know, it probably wouldn't be much of a game at that point. You might as well just sat down and write, write your own novel. Yeah, or exactly. the world. 
So one of the ones that came to me after I had already done all the research and done all the show notes is I realized that Jim Pinto's games, which uh, Danielle played in the one I played in, uh, the protocol system uses playing cards, though that uses them just as story prompts. So in that game, that game's all about improv acting, really. There's no resolution mechanic. You are given a scene, you are giving a, a place the scene happens, you are giving a s- setting for the scene, and you, I, as far as I remember, you might be given like a, a goal to do with the scene, like what you're trying to accomplish, and you just kind of go, and then the moderator just calls it, or the group as a whole is kind of like, yeah, yeah, we're done talking about the thing, let's move on to the next one. But that used playing cards to go, you'd flip the card to go, you are going to be discussing this, and you are located, here's your backdrop, here's your setting. And the one we played was, uh, I, I'm trying to remember, the downfall of Atlantis. It was something Atlantis. I apologize. I hadn't Googled it um, beforehand. It was something about Atlantis. Oh, uh, man, I can't remember the name of it. But, like, I remember one of them was was, was above, among the beasts and men was one of the, whatever the card draws. So would mean fall of Atlantis. Thank you. So Danielle was actually in the game I played. So there, that, that's a coincidental. That's why we summoned her tonight. Um, and I remember that that particular card or, or whatever suit came up many times. And it, whenever we had among the beasts and men, we were always like in crowded streets or we were out in the farms. It was always a busy area where we were having our thing. Uh, and, and it was very like, much a looks like it was actually desperation of Atlantis. I, desperation I just found the Queen of City Atlantis. Conquest, the Queen City Conquest there you uh, schedule, and it's desperation, desperation of, of Atlantis. Atlantis. And what it is, you're basically playing the fall of Atlantis and determining what causes it to sink under the seas. Uh, in our game, they were at war with Athens, I think it was. That shows how long ago it was. But that's <laughs> another game that uses uh, used cards. Um, but again, for mainly, a, 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 it definitely a role-playing experience. We definitely had characters. I don't think we used the cards to generate our characters. If I remember, we were just kind of picked and filled out some prompts. But they definitely used a standard deck of cards for uh, when, when was the one running it, uh, moderating, would use the cards to, to set each scene. And yes, it was Athens. You were... Uh... Athens, yeah. Yep. That's I thought so. It was actually a really good game. That was a fantastic game, actually. Yeah. Her character was Athenian. Right, I, I, right. I, was, I was the representative of the merfolk, which there was nothing in the game that said there were merfolk, but I decided to be the representative of the merfolk. So from that point mm-hmm. on, uh, uh, there were merfolk. Brian Brian jumped in thinking that the uh, the the solitaire RPG uh, concept was niche. Uh, just before we mentioned <laughs> it, I found 157 different games. Again, well, the, the concept of RPG as a solo game at all is is a little questionable. I know there are people who have do solo RPGs, and and and, but I, I find the whole idea a little on the questionable side, but. Since we're doing playing cards and solitaire yeah. is such a, a theme for playing cards in general, I thought uh, we could, uh, you know, ride that knife's Fair. edge and, and find a few. And I think Slasher really, really of, of all of them was the most uh, sol- solitaire um, RPG of them all. Yeah, I think in general, most people in that case are using the video game RPG concepts of I have a character, I level up, I collect loot, I collect yep. gear, all those aspects of an RPG, not actually playing a role. Yeah. Uh, and, think, and going through the list, I mean, again, there were 157. I think the first several I went through were not RPG at all. I mean, they were they yeah. were. So new, they were new versions of solitaire <laughs> mm-hmm. and i mean someone might have painted a theme o- loosely yeah. over top but it was just another solitaire game it's it's like saying uh, king's corner is an rpg because you're playing a jailer trying to put the kings in the <laughs> four jail cells in the corners or something right yeah, like yeah, yeah, it's that yeah. kind of stretch all right uh, all right are we good we got anything before... else from the chat room i didn't notice anything else we're, we're a little later than usual chat room but it's still it's great to see the people who are there uh, after taking three weeks off i'm glad anyone remembers we're still around <laughs> Absolutely. so good to see so soaked back well the merch is good in the states uh but we still have uh covid here in canada that is locking down our uh, suppliers in ottawa but i've got mine Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'll we'll start we'll start selling people the the yeah, uh, the, the files to yeah, go we'll, print we'll, their own. Yeah, that's the there's you go. <laughs> um, uh, All right, I think we're good. <clears throat> and now a look at Tyrants of the Underdark. We would like to thank Gale Force Nine for providing us with a review copy of this game. 
Pirates of the Underdark was designed by Peter Lee, Rodney Thompson, and Andrew Bean. Features artwork from Steve Ellis. In North America, this one was published in 2016 by Gale Force 9 under license from Wizards of the Coast. Uh, this is a mashup of deck building and board game that plays two to four players with games taking about an hour to an hour and a half depending on the player count. For a look at what you get, be sure to check out our Tyrants of the Underdark unboxing video on YouTube. Now, in regard to physical components, everything here is very well produced. You got solid boards, cool little assassin minis, uh, serviceable generic units uh, that are little shields, some tokens, and lots and lots of cards. I get into the details of what you get over on the blog. I don't think it's worth covering everything here. Now, to start a game of Tyrants of the Underdark, you're going to put out the board, which shows an abstract map of the Underdark with boxes representing locations and large circles, nine of them representing drow cities. And there's white routes connecting them. Each of these has a various, varying number of slots for placing units in just little round spots on the map. You start by filling some of the slots on the board with neutral units. These are a little light gray. And then every player is going to pick one of the locations. No, nope, not the cities. One of the locations as a starting base. And they claim one of the spots on there with one of their units. This is a pretty traditional deck building game. So everyone starts off with an identical set of 10 cards, which comprised of three soldiers and seven nobles. They're going to shuffle their cards and draw half of these. The card market is created by taking two what they call half decks. So this is something unique to Tyrants in the Underdark I hadn't seen in another game before. The game comes with four of these, and what you do is you're going to pick two of the four half decks and shuffle them together to make the market. From this combined deck, you're going to deal six cards face up, so you're looking at a variable market like in games like Star Realms or Ascension. You're also going to have a set of standard cards that are always available. Uh, again, think Star Realms or Ascension or Clank. Well, so your standard deck builder, starting with that, uh, starting that most experienced listeners will be immediately familiar with. Yeah, this is, is very much starts off, at least, as a traditional deck building game. Now, each turn, you're going to play your hand of cards in any order you choose. Your initial cards, your, your soldiers and your um, nobles, are going to produce one of two resources, either influence or power. And I'm sure you can guess which produces which. Influence is used to buy new cards from the market. That's your money. Purchase cards are placed directly into a player's discard pile. Power, though, is the where this starts deviating from most deck building games. Power is what's used to interact with the board. One point of power lets you place a new troop out on the board where you have presence, which means one of your troops is there or it's next to somewhere where you have a troop. With three power, you can get rid of an opponent's spy, a bit more about them in a bit, or assassinate a troop that's out there. Assassinated troops are taken from the board and placed into the assassinating player's trophy area. And you are going to get points at the end of the game for everyone you've assassinated. Remember, you are playing Dark Elves in this game. If at any point a player has majority control of one of the Drow cities, again, these are the bigger round spots on the board, you're going to take a control token. This gives you more influence. And again, influence is what you use to buy more cards. Filling every spot on a city. So if a city has, say, six spots, having the majority of people in there. So you have two people in there, no one else is there, you get control. If you fill all six spots, you get total control. This actually lets you flip that control marker over, and you start earning victory points every turn you're able to keep the city under total control. Additionally, at the end of the game, every spot on the board, every location has a number next to it, a value. Every location you control is going to give you points at the end of the game, and you're going to get bonus points for having complete control of locations. So aside from the very strange fact that we are mashing area control and deck builder into a single game, mm -hmm. none of the actual territory we're, we're treading here is new. It's very bog standard deck builder and standard deck uh, area control, really. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, without the combat, from most area control games. So what you're not going to find here is your risk rolling looking for sixes. Instead, you're going to be playing cards using that power to instantly eliminate troops. There's no random factor here, except for the cards you draw, of course. Now, cards purchased from the market 
are going to give you usually some influence or power. So those are your two main main resources in the game. But many of them will also have additional abilities. Now, I'm not going to get into how each of these work or the exact names of them here. I don't think it's worth it. Um, but they're going to let you do things like place spies, remove already placed spies to get something, assassinate troops automatically, uh, move troops on the board, Displace troops, which is you actually supplant, you replace an opponent's troop with one of your own, um, manipulate the card market, devour cards, the dragons tend to like to devour things for some reason, which actually removes cards from the game, and more. Now, one particular ability that I do want to mention that is unique to this game is an ability called Promote, and this is something that fits the theme really well. This is an ability that allows you to promote the cards you have in your deck into what's called your inner circle, which is physically just a, a board that you put them on and it happens to be round, but it represents your drow household promoting people from within. Now, at the end of the game, every card you've collected in all your deck, every card you've got, everything in your discard pile is worth points, but cards in your inner circle are worth more. So it sounds like that's going to be your only main, if not only, deck reduction mechanic for mm -hmm. your deck builder. But you need to balance ridding yourself of good cards, which will be worth more in your inner circle, versus just dumping the junk and get, making yes. your deck a tighter uh, deck builder. Yeah, and this is actually the only deck re reduction mechanic. It, it's it's a privately controlled only if you get promotion cards. Now, it is worth noting, again, your original cards can't do this. You will have to purchase a card from the market that lets you promote. Now, there are a number of them, and again, we talked about those half decks. Some of the half decks have more promotion cards in them than others. The dragon deck, not so many. The drow deck, lots of them. Now, play continues, uh, going around the table, playing your cards, putting out stuff on the map, manipulating things until someone runs out of units, um, or the market deck runs out. Now, note, in all the games I played, we never had the market deck run out. Always someone plays their last unit, and that triggers the game end. Now, as mentioned already, you're going to get points for the cards you've collected, uh, including the cards in your deck and your, your cards you promoted, your areas you control on the map with bonus points for total control, uh, victory tokens you've collected, that's for controlling the cities, which I mentioned earlier, for each enemy troop you've killed and the trophy hall as well. At the end of the game, player with the most points wins. Well, that's certainly easy enough to pick the winner. <laughs> now, as for my feelings on this drow-themed game, after just one play, like just the first time I played this game, I was wowed. I was like, wow, this is one of the best deck building games I played. Now, since then, like I, if you go on the blog, there's a review I wrote then. Like this is one of those ones I, I don't often do a first thoughts review. I was so excited about this game. I had to write about it right away. Now, since then, I played this game many times and my thoughts haven't changed. This is a fantastic deck builder, but it's more than that. It's also a really solid area control game. I like this Dungeons and Dragons themed game. The designers managed to take two very different styles of games, games that for years have stood alone on their own and mash them together and make something that's more than the individual parts. Some of the things that I think really stand out about Tyrants of the Underdark include the following. For one, the whole half deck thing is great for making the market interesting. Every other deck builder I play, you just play with the whole deck and maybe you buy expansions and you throw them in the deck and the deck just gets builder, bigger. By including four different half decks, only two of which you use each game, you end up with six possible different markets right out of the box. Now in addition, there's an expansion pack out there with two more decks, which ups that to 15 different possible decks. And each deck is designed to have its own unique twist. I already kind of mentioned the dragon deck and the drow deck. Well, the demon deck, you have these sacrifices that you want to feed to the demons and having them in your deck stinks because they're worth minus points if you have any sacrifices left. Because how dare you have sacrifices and not actually send them to the demons? Like they did a really good job of making each deck feel unique. The next thing I really dig is that promotion system, that whole way to purge cards from your deck and put it into your inner circle. And what's really interesting, and the first time I played this game, I hadn't played Tante Koro, which is a Japanese made theme deck building game that actually has a really similar mechanic called chambering. And I, this uses that mechanic, but in my opinion, even better. What I like the most here is what Sean mentioned earlier is the decision, the hard choice of I've got an eight cost dragon that instantly kills two troops and gives me seven power. And every time he comes up in my deck, I can do a ton of stuff. 
but if I promote him, he's worth 10 victory points. And that decision on when to promote that dragon or do you keep it in your deck or not? Or do I just try to wean out all the, the, the garbage cards? Do I get rid of all my swords and nobles? Which makes your deck a little thinner, but they're only worth one point each, right? Like, I love that decision point. Other thing I like is how spies work. So every player in Tyrants of the Dark gets five little spy miniatures, which are actually kind of cool looking, but no way to use them at the start of the game. Now, once you play the game once, you're going to see how this works. And the way it works is you're going to find cards that are spy cards. And every single spy card in the game does two things. First, it lets you place a spy at any location on the board. Now, this on its own is super powerful because you can only place units where you have presence. Well, placing a spy gives you presence. So all of a sudden, your army is all on the left side of the board. You suddenly throw a spy on the right side of the board. You now have presence there. And all of a sudden, your units start showing up over there, right? Now, second, each card with a spy ability has a second ability that goes off if you take back one of your spies. So this, these tend to be really powerful, often generating lots of power influence, usually like three or four power, three or four influence, or letting you um, supplant or assassinate multiple troops at once. Now, what this means in play is that every spy action is actually a two-step process. The first is using a card to build your spy network and then using another card or the same card if you cycle through your deck to actually put that spy network to use. Which leads me to the other thing that I think has probably already been pretty clear in this review is how well the mechanics tie to that drow theme. That dark elf conniving, stabbing in the back, underhanded spy filled society. I am always impressed by how well this makes me feel like I'm controlling a drow family. Well, some of this comes from the artwork and the flavor text, like it's all there, but really that's kind of pasted on. It's the actual gameplay, like the promotion system. That is so fitting with drow society, deciding who to promote and when to promote, as well as that use of spies to spread your control and the feeling of building a spy network and how one house could win just by having the best spy network is again fits. The fact that you're not, killing the opponent's troops they're going to combat you're assassinating and you're supplanting troops all of this fits that D, &D drought theme perfectly and and given my thoughts on some certain other D, &D board <laughs> themed board games i have to count this as a huge plus uh unlike others this isn't just a uh, D, D paint job on a euro with some flavor text to make it licensed yeah, I was wondering if you were going to call out that game. I, I, I know your opinions on that game, and we'll leave it as the game that shall not be mentioned tonight. But yes, there, this this does D&D &D right in a way. At least this aspect of D&D, &D, right. the, the drow aspect. And like I said, just even the way like the dragon cards work or the way the demon deck plays different than the drow deck. Oh, it's really well done for like I, you don't expect it from the game until you start thinking about why things are working and like the, even the way the spies work. Well, why can I only place this fire take one away? Well, you got to build the network before you can use it, right? Like right. I, even that's thematic. Now, I say, despite all this praise, the game isn't perfect. Um, my main complaint is the look of the game, the aesthetic. I, it's just too dark and and samey, and everything's kind of bland. Uh, the player colors are even bland and hard to tell apart. The player boards are only separated by a player color, a bar of color. The orange and the red, even not having color blindness problems, are very close together. And then the other two colors are dark blue and black. Um, the entire thing's just drab. And the board, I really don't like. Like, it's this actually, like, this game's been out for a long time and I didn't play it for years because it just looked like a game of risk. Like, it just, nothing about that board with little shields on it draws me in at all. Now, I get it. It's it's under dark. It should be dark and blues and purples, and but I, I don't know. They could have done something to make it pop a little more than they did with this one. Yeah, one of the major advantages of Warhammer's Dark Elves over D&D Drow, you get a much better color palette, palette in Warhammer. <laughs> You know, but even sticking to the dark color, I don't know, throw something on there to, to, to just make it stick out a little more. Make, worry a little less about the aesthetics and a little bit more on the mechanics. I don't know. I, I, it could have been used to be improved. Now, the other issues we found while playing Tyrants in the Other Dark um, are just the, the generic deck building problems. Like the reason there are people out there that don't like deck builders. Uh, the randomness of the market can mean that some players are presented with better options than others. I, I hate that feeling of there's nothing to buy. I buy something I don't really want. And then this great card comes up for the next player. 
which is frustrating when it happens once, but when it happens on your turn four times in a row, you get a little frustrated. Also, it does have the thing where higher cost cards tend to be better than lower price cards. And it's often the case that you're just going to buy whatever you can afford. So you sit there and go, oh, I got eight influence. I look over, what's the highest cost card? Oh, there's a six. Okay, let me see the six. Yep, I'll buy that. I got two left. Okay, let me see the two twos. I buy this two. And not even worry about the rest of the cards up there. That is definitely a case in this game. Um, I wouldn't say it's as bad as Ascension, which I personally find is the game that's the worst for it kind of plays itself. There are at least you'll pro usually have multiple sixes up to choose from. Um, but that is definitely a thing. Uh, and it is mitigated a bit by the way certain cards combo together. Like you could definitely try to work on a promotion strategy. So if you're working on a promotion strategy, you might want that four promotion card over that six dragon because you want promotion cards. Same thing with like spy networks. If you're trying to do the spy network thing, you're probably going to favor spy cards over possibly higher cost cards that say move troops. So there is a little bit of that offset, but like it's still there. It's still a deck builder. It's going to have all the problems that pretty much every deck builder ever published is going to have. Now, is there a way to wipe or recycle the market? I know that's a mechanic that some deck builders are often integrating now to try and reduce the impact of that bad market on, on gameplay. Uh, there are cards that devour cards in the market where you just remove them from play, but that's it. So if no one buys those cards, there really aren't. And as far as I know, they're only in the dragon deck. So only if you're using that half deck, does that even come up? Okay. So there is no like wipe it. There's no choose to buy nothing and it wipes or it's been the same for three turns. It wipes um, though. I don't remember ever sitting there and being like the market's terrible. Like I've never had it like say in star realms where every ship costs six or higher. And you just at the beginning of the game don't have that kind of influence. Yep. The, the distribution seems to be a little better um, on that. I think the highest cost cards are only seven and it's pretty easy to get influence. Like I say you start with seven, of the nobles so right. you can start easily getting five your first turn of the game or your second turn of the game and quickly if you start buying priestesses they give two influence when they only cost two so it's getting that income is quick though it's a bit of a trap in this game because if you spend two minutes cards getting influence you're not going to get to influence the board because you won't have enough power so that's an aspect of gameplay you don't see in other deck builders right all right overall Tyrant the Dark is not only one of the best deck gilding games I've played and one of the better area majority games I own. It's just one of the best board games in my collection. I have enjoyed every single game I played of Tyrant the Dark. I have never had a bad experience playing this game and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Well, I do kind of wish the game had a bit of a visual up. I have complaints about the actual gameplay and I am still, every time I play is shocked by just how thematic it, is and how I actually get that feel of running a drow household. If you're a deck building fan and you don't own Tyrants of the Underdark, just go pick this up, fix that, go get it. If, if you like deck building even just a bit, you're gonna like this. If you like folk on a map, area majority games, I think it's worth checking out. Uh, it's gonna be very different from your dice-based risk or your card-driven commanding color style games, right? Or even your um, area majority Twilight Struggles, right? This is a very different feel to that uh style of game if you're a DD fan looking for a surprisingly thematic board game experience that lets you take on the role of a drow household check this game out and heck if you're none of these things you should still try tyrants of the underdark it is a really good game it is one of the best games i own and i there i'm sure those people out there don't enjoy this one but i think they're going to be few and far between well, for a somewhat more in-depth look, although perhaps not as excitable, look <laughs> at Tyrants of the Underdark, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Let's take a look at the Pathfinder Adventure card game set, the newly rebooted entry point to this long-running card game. We would like to start by thanking Paizo for providing us with a review copy of this core set. Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core Set was designed by Mike Sillinker with help from Chad Brown, Keith Richmond, Avia Schertzen, and Liz Spann. Features artwork from Jay Epperson. This was published last year, 2019, 
by Paizo, and it's a follow-up and reboot to their already popular Pathfinder Adventure Card Game series, uh, which has been out for quite a long time. Now, this particular box set is designed for one to four players and includes a short adventure path called the Dragon's Demand. Now, the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game is a cooperative campaign-based card game played out over a number of separate adventures, each which takes about an hour, an hour and a half, at least once you've finally uh, figured out all the rules and you're used to how the game plays. Now, as a campaign game, uh, players will choose characters that they are going to involve and improve on throughout the campaign. It is meant to be played in order, uh, though the existing box set does have a way to keep playing once you finish. For a look at what you get inside the new core set, you can check out our unboxing video on YouTube, a link to which you can find in the show notes. All right, so I have a few things I want to cover in regards to components here on the podcast for this game. Uh, for one, Paizo made a big change here with the box insert based on previous installments of the Pathfinder Adventure Card game. Because all the previous ones, you would buy the, the base set, and then there would be a number of adventure path modules you would buy to continue the story and the base box was a larger box and included a molded plastic insert these had not only a spot for everything in that set but spots for all of the further adventures path and expansion content all the characters all the extra spells and all the different chapters of the campaign so what you ended up with was this very well organized space for everything that was part of that adventure path so if you were going to play say the skull and shackles adventure path you would buy the base set and then all the adventures for it and it would all fit in your nice skull and shackles box for some reason they threw this out the window i i have no idea why now you have a pretty much standard three column card game box the same kind you see from marvel legendary and dc deck builder with nothing but dividers and foam blocks to separate your cards now while cost effective i can't say that's a welcome change at all yeah. as i've been strongly disappointed in my choice to go with the dc multiverse box as the holder for this very reason i don't know why they did this um i to be honest i haven't seen a lot of longtime fans complaining but me doing the research when i got this game and looking up how to play videos and stuff i'm like why doesn't my box have that like that just looks so much cooler um other than that disappointment everything else is great um i love the fact there were was a quick start guide one of those read me first right that tells you how to use what's in the box and fair warning do that. Read it before you use anything in the box. Uh, as you'll find, see in the unboxing video, I chose to open a random pack of cards, and that was not the proper one to start with. <laughs> so the quick start guide does warn you that first play, you only need this stuff. Um, there are some really rather thick rules. Uh, storybook with the first adventure pass, some standees, um, stands for the standees, some counters, set of blue dice. Um, interestingly, not a full RPG set. There's no D20 used in this game. So you don't get a full set of Pathfinder dice with this, but you do get a set of polyhedrals minus the D20. And well, lots of cards, lots and lots of cards, uh, 440 cards to be exact, even though they only take up about 10% of that box. Now that we have an idea of what you get, and there's a lot, how about an overview of how this game plays? All right, so step one, you're about to play a Pathfinder game. The same thing you would do with the pen and paper RPG is you are going to sit down and make a character. Um, there are 18 pre-generated characters to choose from. Uh, these include many of the iconics from the Pathfinder lore. Anyone who plays Pathfinder knows what I'm talking about. They're named characters that have carried over in the Pathfinder lore since the beginning of it. So there are 18 iconics to choose from. You're going to find the character for the card you like. On that card, you are going to get a deck list. This is going to tell you how many cards of each card type you're going to select to build your deck to play. Uh, as an example, the character I chose to play is Fumbus, the Goblin Alchemist. My deck in Pathfinder the Adventure Card Game contains two weapons, two spells, one armor, six items, one ally, and three blessings. Now, what I like in that quick start guide is for people who've never played before, having to make this choice makes no sense. Like, you don't know the game yet. How do you know what to pick? or what's gonna to work together. So what they've done is they do give you a sample deck for four of the characters. And the Quick Start Adventure actually has you play those four characters to get to know the rules. I had moved away from those characters really way because there's a Goblin Alchemist who blows stuff up. Uh, now, could a new player still manage to build a deck that was just garbage? Or does this list on the character cards help avoid that? 
Well, the thing is, the list is going to give you a balanced deck, but you might pick things that don't work for your character class well. So you're like, I, I would have to grab one of the other ones to see what they start with. But Deanna is playing some type of spell caster. So she has like six spell cards instead of six items. So you are very limited. So you're going to have at least the stuff your thing could use. But like you may grab a bunch of like my two weapons. I could have grabbed uh, a broadsword and an axe. And it ends up my character is actually way better at ranged attacks. So it is possible to build a not great character. But once you play the character, like once you play the game once, the you'll see what works with that character and you can tweak your deck between games, which a bit more about that later. Okay. All right. Once each player has built their character, you're going to pick an adventure to play from the storybook. Now, in this case, you are expected to play them in order. There is a tutorial called the, the rumble road. If you haven't played the game before, uh, which I do recommend trying as someone who hasn't played the game before, uh, there is a small reward. So it might be worth playing even if you have played before and just to check, because from what I understand, there are some rule tweaks from the original edition of the game. So it might be a good way to figure those out. If you haven't, uh, if you want, you can skip past that and go to the first part of the adventure path, which is called plans gone wrong. You are going to play through the adventure. And once you succeed, you then move on to the next one in the book and continue doing that until you finish the adventure path. Uh, the adventure path in the base book is called Dragon's Demand. Um, it interestingly includes a final scenario for generating random adventures. So even if you played through the entire thing, you actually have two options at that point. I see no reason you couldn't play through with a different character and it would be a very different experience. This isn't the kind that this is, this is a card game. This is not an RPG. You don't necessarily, you, you might know what villain cards you're going to face, but you don't know. It's not a story game. There's no, you don't, you haven't solved the mystery already, right? It's, it's not an exit game. It's not Scooby-Doo escape from the haunted mansion. You could easily replay through the story, but if you don't want to, it does give you a completely random adventure generation system in the back of the book, which I thought was cool. Right. And I find that actually really kind of important because if you look at how much Pathfinder Adventure card game content there is, it can to the, you know, you know, uninformed observer seem pretty money grabbish. Yeah. But if you don't need to have adventure paths and you can still keep playing, that's reassuring. So I don't, it, it, I think it's more, to be honest, fan demand than money grabbing. Like that's, that's what Pathfinder does. Pathfinder produces all of their content, Paizo, sorry, the, the company behind Pathfinder produces all of their content in a subscription format. So what happens is you would sign up for an adventure path and it would send you the base game. And then a month later, they would send you the first expansion pack. And then a month later, they would send you the next expansion pack and they would do that. That's how they did it for the Pathfinder adventure card game. Same as what they do for their role-playing game. So it's the same type of thing, right? So that's part of why there's so much is that what's actually demand. That's been their format since, well, this is the company that brought us Dragon and Dungeon Magazine. And they're used to putting out monthly content in Dungeon and Dragon and it kind of fits, right? Now this time they did deviate from that because this time you have the base box and it has a full adventure path. And so far there's just one other box with another adventure path in it. So it seems like they've moved away from that. And you'll notice since 2019, now there might be other things going on in the world that have delayed things there isn't the 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 glut of content that we saw for the previous editions but the way it was staggered out makes it look like there's more than there is so basically what they did is they put all the chapters into one book now whereas before you would get a box with a set of new cards for the first chapter and then a month later you get another box with another set of cards and another book and then well actually it wasn't even a book before before the the it was all cards now they've written a story in a book so it's a, it's a change in format well, for, so what I was seeing was you get a core set. So you get a, there's a, a $60 core box. Yeah. And then um, five or six, I think it is deck. Yeah. Packs the adventure pack as well. Adventure. Packs. Yes. And then We're, some of them have a character pack as well. Yeah. Some had it or a magic pack or an item yeah. pack that you could get, but those six separate boxes are now one box and one book. So it doesn't, it, it's still as much content. It's just not split up. So I don't know. Um, so getting back to actually how, yeah, how you play <laughs> instead of the, their marketing choices, um, what's going to happen is you got your characters, you're, you've looked up your first adventure, and every adventure is going to have you set up a number of location decks. The number of location decks is going to be equal to the player, number of players plus one, um, I think in every case. Each location, similar to your player card, is going to have a list of cards that belong in its deck that you're going to randomize from all the cards you own 
based on the scenario level. So you start off at scenario level one. So you're going to take all your level one monsters, shuffle them together, and then put those in the deck for the location. Route. And then you're going to go through all your level one barriers, shuffle them together and do it. When you get up to level two scenario, you're going to mix in your level one and two stuff. When you get to level three scenario, you're going to mix in level one, two, and three stuff. Now, for example, the trail location has a deck consisting of four monsters, two barriers, one item, one ally, and one blessing. A different location would have a different set of those. So you're not going to go to the trail location if you want to learn a spell, which kind of makes sense. What you're probably going to run into on a trail is barriers and monsters. Barriers are like traps or physical hazards. Uh, what you might find is an ally. You might find a lost item. And, well, you might get blessed by the gods. So that's kind of how the theme ties into a location. The other thing you're going to do is you are going to pick out a number of Bane cards. These include dangers, a main villain, a boss, basically, and the boss's henchman. You're going to take the boss and the henchman. You're going to evenly split them over to the decks. So you've got one henchman or the villain in each of the location decks. Then you're going to shuffle the location decks. No one knows what's where. Now, the goal of a standard adventure is to find that villain. You're going to go through the various locations, trying to hunt down and defeat the villain before time runs out. A part of this is going to involve trying to find the henchman, because if you can defeat the henchman, you can close the location they're at. Now, close just means it's like locked up. That location's done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, if you meet the villain ahead of time before the locations are closed and you defeat them, instead of being vanquished, they escape and run away and they end up at a different location. So that's an important part of the game is closing out locations, then find the boss fight and defeat them. Now, I did mention this before time runs out. This is represented by a deck of blessing cards called the clock. At the start of every turn, you're going to flip over a blessing card. If that deck ever runs out, you lose the game. We never actually had that happen, but we did get close. Now, the way this all works involves a lot of little details and little rules, and there's no way I can cover it here. Like, the rule book for this game is 30 pages, two columns, small text. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is summarize this so it makes sense and gives you a good kind of overview of how it plays. Because we want to sleep sometime tonight, not put you to sleep with rules reading. <laughs> so on your turn, you're going to do the following things in this order. You can give another player at the same location as you a card. This way you can trade equipment, allies, spells, everything you got, including the stuff you put in your starting deck. It's not necessarily yours. It's just, hey, take my sword. Hey, here's a healing potion. Um, you can then move. You take your pawn and move it to a different location. You could then may explore the location. This involves flipping over the top card of the location and encountering it. I'll get to that important phase in a bit because that's the big chunk of the game. If you're at an empty location, so all the cards in the location have gone through, you've gone through that entire deck, you've discovered everything there, you can try to close the location. Every location card has a different way it's closed that's described on the card. I'm not going to get into the details of how to close each one because they're all different. Finally, at the end of your turn, you say, I'm done. I end my turn, which triggers some end of round stuff like drawing cards and so on. Now, encountering cards is the meat of the game, right? That whole, I explore my location. I flip a card over and encounter it. When you encounter a card, you're going to go through anything that says unencountered because some stuff happens right away. Traps, for example, tend to happen instantly. As soon as you encounter the card, something happens. You then get the ability to use any evasion abilities. To be honest, I haven't even seen these. I have to assume like the thief characters or some of the items or invisibility cloaks or something let you do this, but it's a way to avoid the card that was drawn. If not avoided, you then are going to attempt any checks listed on the card. Now, checks are done to either acquire beneficial cards. So when you draw a weapon, an army, or an ally, a spell, or an item, what it represents is that you, you've discovered a way to gain that thing, and you just have to make a skill check to be able to get it whatever that represents in the story. So if you find a suit of armor around the trail, you're going to make a check to see if you can acquire that suit of armor. The other thing you'll be checking for is to avoid the negative effects of the bad cards, the monsters, the villains, the henchmen, the dangers, and the barriers. Now, checks are, are, are pretty much what you'd expect from a game based on Pathfinder, except it doesn't use a d20 here, is you're going to roll a number of dice based on your character abilities. And different characters have different size dice assigned to different stats and skills and attacks. These are all going to be modified by the cards that you have in your hand. Because remember, this is a, a, a card-based game. 
Things like weapons are going to give you attack dice. Items might give you bonus dice for checks against barriers or spells might give you chances to put out. And there's all kinds of interactions here. Blessings are, are religious things, blessings from the gods. Those let you double your dice pool. Some cards, interestingly, can be used to play on other players. So it'll say like adds a D8 on your attack or a D4 on another attack at your location. So you can actually give bonus dice to other players. Um, I even had one item that was a crossbow that let me add bonus dice to people at other locations because I was, you know, whatever, I was across the area. So I had initially been feeling like this was in many ways similar to the Lord of the Rings card games in some ways, but the use of the dice as well as, as well as uh, the, the character uh, advancement uh, mm -hmm. part is a really sharp diversion from, from just the card based uh, system. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say they're similar at all, except no, for no. they're both card games for playing yeah. out fantasy adventures. But that's about it. So once you got all your dice, you got a dice pool. You're going to roll them. You're going to add them together. If you beat the check number, you get the card, or you defeat the hazard. Um, when you defeat the hazard, you just return to the box. There's no reward for killing a monster. You just don't take the penalty. Cards gains this way. So like, if you you get that suit of armor, you can immediately use it. It goes into your hand. You can immediately use that card. Failed checks can result in a number of things. Um, may make you um, get nothing. So for most beneficial cards, like that suit of armor, when you fail the check, you just didn't get it. You just put that card in the box. The armor's gone until maybe you find it in your next adventure. Same thing for like the item, the ally, the spell, whatever it is you're trying to get is lost. Now, most monsters, barriers, and dangers tend to cause damage. Again, we're looking at a, a pen and paper style role-playing game feel here. Interestingly, you have no hit points in this game. Your health in this game is your cards. Taking damage involves discarding cards from your hand to your discard pile. And the number you discard is usually the difference between the total on your dice and the difficulty of the check. So you needed a nine, you rolled a six, you take three damage. Armor cards, some spells, some items can be used to mitigate this. So a suit, that suit of plate mail that we picked up earlier on the trail might say discard to prevent three damage. So instead you're losing one suit of armor instead of three cards from your hand. Healing is interesting because it's the opposite way. So a healing potion is going to let you get 1d4 cards from your discard shuffle back into your deck. So that's your, your deck and your discard is your health. If a character ever can't draw a card from the draw pile, they've discarded the last card in their deck and they can't draw, they're dead. Your, your character's gone. You can no longer be played, like ever. Like this isn't a, you can just retry the scenario. No, your character's dead. Permanent, permadeath in this game. Um, unless you saved up a hero point, which is something, one of the rewards you can get. If you saved up a hero point, you can spend a hero point to bring your character back to life. Other than that, boom, gone, dead. So this is, in some ways, aside from the permadeath aspect of, of this, uh, the first of our uh, sort of similarities to Gloomhaven here, where yeah. your deck is your life. Yeah, very true. Actually, I hadn't even thought of the two being similar because Gloomhaven's hand management is so different from this game. But yeah, definitely like that. And there's a, there's actually a number of similarities. I think I, I point yep. out a few as we go along. All right. Sounds good. I look forward to it. So one of the most complicated parts about this game that takes a bit to get used to is your whole deck management, right? Your deck is your health. So once you use a card for a check, something's going to happen to that card. And it all depends on what card it is. And this is the part that's really hard to cover without getting into little details. Like some of them just say reveal. Your armor's like this. That plate mail can prevent one damage. All you have to do is show the card. Look, I have plate mail. Done. I prevented one damage. But then some of them also have additional effects. So the plate mail might also say, or prevent three damage by discarding it. And then other cards will um are, are what's called refreshed what refreshed means is the card goes in the bottom of your deck and most of the spells in the game work this way so you like cast a fireball the fireball is used up it goes to the bottom of your deck and you can't cast fireball again until it comes back up again very rpg like right now banished cards are removed from play so if you cast that fireball and it, it might be like a, a different spell might like invisibility or something might say it's banished um, what that usually happens is when the wizard or the warrior tries to cast fireball in the game, technically the wizard's not trained in arcana. If he uses a spell card, it's banished from the game. So you get a chance to use it. So I think that represents your spell scrolls. Um, there's also discarded cards that you use them once they're discarded. There's single use cards. There's also the ability called buried where you place the card under your character sheet. And what that means is you can't use the card again, that scenario, but you'll have it back next time. It's still in your deck. Uh, there's a, a big part of this game 
is managing your hand and your deck and making sure you don't run out of cards. And also cycling the cards you do have with that refresh ability so that you have what you need for each challenge on hand. Now, again, this is a card game. As is expected in all card-based games, this is exception-based. Everything I've been mentioned can and will be modified by other stuff. Your character abilities, the abilities on your cards, the text on the cards you encounter, the locations each have modifiers for any card drawn at that location. Um, the hour it is on the clock, when you flip up that blessing, it'll say, if this card is the hour, this effect, that. there's just all kinds of crazy interactions going on. An example of that is spells. Every spell in the game says, do this thing, then the card's banished. But if you're proficient, instead, discard this card. But if you make a skill check, you only have to refresh the card. And that's kind of how every card reads. Each location has special rules. Each blessing card has things that go off. There's times when it'll say, face the danger. Well, at the start of every adventure, you're going to put out a card called the danger. And then as you're going through the deck exploring, it'll say, ooh, you have to face the danger. So for example, it might be like, you fall into a trap, face the danger. And then depending on what scenario you're playing, the danger is different. This is a game all about cards interacting with other cards. So, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So this continues until players find and defeat the villain at least for a standard adventure. Because again, some of the adventures in the Dragon's Demand Adventure Path has special rules and other victory conditions. But a standard game is explore various locations until you find the henchmen and defeat them to close the locations, eventually find the boss monster and defeat it. I'm saying monster, but it could be an NPC or whatever. If you manage to complete the adventure, you get a reward as listed in the storybook. Now this often includes getting some. Uh, either specific or random cards like it might be go find this item card and get it or it might be you find a random ally where you'll take all your allies in the game shuffle them and draw one or it might just be you get a blessing the other thing you may get uh, especially once you get a couple adventures in are hero points this is how you level up your character in this game each character card has a number of check boxes that can be checked off by spending one hero point for each box these are all over the card. Like you can improve your skills. You can improve your basic stats. You can improve your attack abilities. Uh, you can change the amount of cards you have in your deck. Like remember my, my goblin could only have six items. Well, I have a checkbox to make that so I can have seven items. Note by adding cards to your deck, you're also giving yourself more health. So that's also your way to get more hit points. Um, there are individual character abilities. And there's even a whole thing with, I forget what they call them in Pathfinder, but prestige classes where you can kind of level up to a better version of the alchemist with my character by spending hero points. The other thing you can use them for is you can use them for rerolls while you're playing. Though I gotta say, I, I don't know who playing this game is gonna save hero points for rerolls <laughs> compared to leveling up your character. I, I don't see the logic in that. And then there's the ever important one I mentioned earlier where if you die, you could spend a hero point to bring your character back to life. So Deanna is the one playing this game cautiously. She got her first hero point and has saved that since. Uh, me, I've spent everyone I've got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fate point or XP, that's a seriously hard decision to make. I mean, reroll, I don't think that's much of a... Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe if you've got a ton later, like, you know, you're, you're however many adventures in and you've got more than yeah, you can ever use. But uh, up front, uh, fate point or XP, just I, I can see how that's a tough decision to, to make. I don't know, I went with XP. I, I now do more damage. Anytime I play a card that has the fire acid or, or fire acid ability on it, I get to add an extra D6 to my pool. Come on. How many cards in my deck have fire or acid in them? That's all about the deck building, which leads me to the last thing you do. So after you finish your adventure, you got to build your deck again. You are always limited to having the exact number of every card as listed on your character card, like when you built your character. So again, I am limited to two weapons and six items and one armor, and I forget the rest of them off the top of my head. Um, so you're going to have to look at what cards you have. And what's interesting is while you were playing, you might have banished some of your cards. So you might have to build your deck, but you're going to also have the stuff you found. And it's kind of like you, you look at what you grabbed and, and, and you also get to share with anyone else who took part in the adventure. So like when we finish a game, Deanna and I always sit there and we're like, all right, where's the new stuff we found? And we make a pile of it. And it's like, all right, we found this ally. We found this armor. We found this weapon. That's a level three armor. We can't keep it. And that's another thing that's interesting too, is when you're playing, you shuffle in every card you own. So you can get higher level stuff coming out. You can use it when you find it that adventure, but you can't keep it unless you're of that level, which is an interesting thing. So 
you're going to sit there and go through what's in it. And what's weird is you also can always add zero level stuff to your deck. And every game we found that we are actually doing that. Like, like there'll be stuff that we banished while we were playing. So it's like, well, now I'm going to have to get a new item out of the basic stuff. Kind of like, think of it going shopping, right? Like you used up your arrows or whatever. You got to go buy more. You've used which up is, your magic arrows. So you got to go buy some, some, you know, bog standard target arrows. Uh, yeah, exactly. Before exactly. you go back out again. So it, it's interesting. So what you, you're going to sit there and rebuild your deck. And what's really weird is i found a lot of the games you end up almost the same like like you you almost just rebuild your character to what you started with which again is very rpg like yeah i guess not surprisingly this is where i'm starting to see a lot of uh parallels and differences between uh this and a game like gloomhaven while mm -hmm. pathfinder of course is an entire world of adventure and paths yeah. as opposed to the set dungeons in the local area of gloomhaven uh, where when you get into card management, well, again, there are there are differences here because you're you know when you burn a card in Gloomhaven, you're going to get it back at the end of the turn. Yes. Whereas if you bury a card, you're it's done and gone. It's and gone. You're never going to see that again. But within that, there are some real similarities in that that fine tuning your deck so that mm -hmm. when you go out to to take on that next dungeon or that next path, you've got the best cards you think you can have. Yeah. To make the difference now the one thing that pathfinder has that we wish gloomhaven has is trading between people <laughs> yes <laughs> um the one jaws missing, of the lion does the one the one missing feature from gloomhaven yeah. jaws of the lion you can trade not yeah. the original another interesting aspect of it too is that cycling through your deck right being able to refresh your cards so you get this thing where deanna will be at a location and she'll run into a wall of fire well, I'm I'm the I'm I'm the artificer, right? I'm the alchemist. I have all the items. She has all the spells, right? So then it's a matter of me trying to cycle through my deck so that I get my acid and I get my water bomb in my hand so that I can move over to her location to help her get past that goal. There's a lot of that that's going on here, which is a really neat thing that you don't see in most of these games. But again, feels Gloomhaven-ish with the the characters helping each other out, right? So as, as we get into final thoughts in the game, now that we basically kind of know how to play. <laughs> Again, this one's a rough one with all the interactions. Uh, this one took me a long time to get to this review. I feel bad. Uh, Paizo sent me this quite some time ago. It's taking me longer than usual to actually get to the review portion of this and get enough gameplays in. And this, this sat on my pile of obligation pretty much longer than any other game. And that's the learning curve. Like that rule book is one of the most intimidating I've ever seen. Like I like short of 18xx and an advanced squad leader like this this is a scary book like it's it's not only just the thickness it's it's how small the font is and how it's written like uh, mike selinker obviously writes role-playing games and not board games like there is a, a very different style of writing used to impart knowledge in a role-playing game compared to a board game and a board game is it's much more instructional whereas rpgs almost are technical manuals right like that's kind of the feel of it and I think the reason for this, especially being this 2019, this new release of a game that's been out since I think 2013, I don't know, it's been out for a long time. There's been a, a, a large number of iterations, different box sets for this out, is that this game is also part of a public play network. There is a Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Society where people can go to local game stores and take part and take part in national tournaments and win prizes and get cards. In this way, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, similar to Magic the Gathering. And just like Magic the Gathering, the rules have evolved to be almost feel like legal documents, right? With the, the, the amount of detail for exceptions and timing and specific card interactions and what parts of the card take precedence over other parts. It's, it, it's, it's a, an intimidating rough read. That's now, I will say... Uh, August 2013 was the 2013. initial so I was right with Rise of the Rune Lords base set. So yeah, 2013, this game's got it, some legs, right? Some teeth, long teeth. So as I said, though, all that said, sorry, all that said, like, it's worth the effort. It's it's worth getting through that rule book and sitting down to play. What I do recommend is don't do what I do and reread the rules 80 times trying to internalize it. Just sit down and start playing. Um, those first few games are going to be rough. Like we, we were to the point of almost frustration of our, every time we flipped a new card, it felt like we had to look something up. Like it was that bad. I was like, all right, we got it. We got it. We got this. All right, flip this. Oh, wait, what's that mean? Okay. Thankfully, the rule book has a really good um, 
index in the back so that that part's thankful um i i is certain the first game we spent more time looking up rules than actually playing and i'll say even now playing through a big chunk of dragon's demand we still have to look up a few things every game i don't think we've had a game yet where we didn't touch the rule book now what is impressive that in all this time we have found the answer to every single question we've had in the rule book there hasn't been a situation we haven't had an answer to like, I've never had to grab my phone and Google. I've never had to go to Board Game Geek. It's all there somewhere. Yeah, and this is such a welcome change from all too many games where the players at the table will be all on their phone Googling and finding different answers yes. often to the question that has arisen. Uh, there just aren't that many games out there that the rule book is that, in you know, complete. Yeah. Which is why it's as thick as it is, right? Like, I get it. it like I said, especially with organized play. Like, you're, you're looking at tournaments where people show up and there, there are prizes on the line. They got to make sure that everything's covered. I get why it's there, but it, it's a rough read. It's, it's a rough, it takes a bit to sink in. And like I said, we're still, to this day, I'm sure if we go downstairs tonight and play a game, there'll be something that I'll be like, wait a minute. All right, the monster has acid resistance, but I have a thing that ignores resistance, but only if you play a fire card and you played your fire card, was that on the same, you know, one of those trying to figure out how it works, and I'm sure it'll be there. Skipping all that to actual gameplay, once you kind of got it down, we've really been enjoying this game. Now, when I first heard about this game, I thought it was a deck builder. Like, I, I was thinking it was, you know, like not exactly, but Dominion Ascension, that aspect of it, that I'm going to have my deck of cards that represents my character, I'm going to go through an adventure, and now my deck's going to be bigger and better. And then I'm going to go through another adventure and my deck's going to be bigger and better. That's not what this is. This is, this is um, more like Magic the Gathering. This is more deck construction. You build your deck at the start of it, each adventure. And then you go through it. And yeah, you might gain a few cards during play, but it's not that common. Like, it's not like you get uh, a resource to buy more cards. There's no central market. There's no thing you can always buy for cost two or a goblin you can always kill to get some XP. It's not like that. Your deck starts off tuned. And by making some jacks during play, you may gain a few cards, but those may not even fit with your deck. Like that's the other aspect of the game that comes up. Like I'm playing a goblin artificer when that plate mail comes up. I don't want that plate mail. I'm not proficient in plate mail. I'm going to put that on and it's just going to take up room in my deck. Meanwhile, my scale mail gives me a nice plus two when I'm trying to hide, right? At the end of the venture, you always clean up your deck. You don't get to keep all the cards you gained, which is different than a deck building game. Most of the time we found, as I mentioned earlier, what you started off with is pretty close to what you end with. There's maybe one or two little tweaks. And another way the game's very different from a deck building game is the feel. Because one of the things you're going to do in a deck building game, and especially by culling your deck, you want to cycle through your deck as much as you can. In this game, if you run out of cards in your draw pile, you die. There's no reshuffle. Now, have you had any of those... Oh, I need to shuffle moments. I mean, especially uh, you know, with with Gloomhaven and things where you're used to, <laughs> you know, that that shuffling through your draw pile. Did you get any of those moments where it was like, oh, oh no, I'm not allowed to do that. This card is discarded. I don't. We never had the problem, but man, the last time we played, we talked about this. I think the last episode where I played extreme, I left four cards in the box. Which now that you know how the game plays, oh, you can yeah. see how bad that is. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, I don't want to have to draw a card. And I'm at the point where I'm like, I can't use my gear to use this fight because if i use my gear i'll have to discard it which would cause me to draw and i have nothing to draw and it's like i would love to be able to use my bomb right now but if i use my bomb i die though if i die d might still win the adventure but it's permadeath so i'm like nope sorry i'm not using my bomb or i've had turns where i'm like i'm not exploring i am not going to explore you go explore you do your thing i'm because you can always discard your cards for free Right. Which again is dangerous because if you discard, that's your health gone. But when I know I have a healing spell somewhere in my deck, I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna throw away this armor for now and hope I draw my healing potion. You go explore over there. I'm busy over here. Right. Now another thing that's uh, a big change from deck building games is that most of the cards here have multiple uses. Um, so I kind of mentioned this again with spells, how how they refresh. But another example is weapons. So for example, an axe might give you a d8 to attack and you can just use that over and over every round you don't you don't have to discard it you just have to show look i have an axe i get a d8 to attack look i still have an axe right it's a role-playing game i've got an axe but that same axe might say refresh to assist an ally at a distant location so you know what it's thematically i can throw my axe 
But if I throw my ax, I no longer have it because now it's at the bottom of my deck and I got to wait till it comes back. It just, it's a really neat way to, to represent that type of mechanic. What all this leads to is a really neat puzzle. Like I, I would honestly say this is a puzzle game. I, I love that feeling of flipping over a card at a location during explorer action, looking at what's there, and then trying to figure out how best to use my cards to overcome it. Then there's the fact the other players are working with you, right? Do you have a blessing card? Oh, do you have anything that'll help on a distant obstacle check? Oh, I got a locked chest. Do you happen to have anything to use that? Do you have an ally you can give me next turn so I can get it in my hand to try to get through the woods because I could use your tracker? All of that happens. And I really like that. And I also like the way the, 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 the cooperation builds from this, because that's something I find missing in a lot of other cooperative board games, that ability to trade items and use your items to affect other players. I don't think I've ever played another game where I can spend my card to help you on your turn. Although, you know, you say that, and now here, I'm going to go back into uh, these Gloomhaven comparisons because... You know, anyone who sits and watches your Friday night streams knows that you're using your action to move D2 spots so that she can attack in yeah. that thing. Or you're making sure that you infuse dark so that on her turn, D can use whatever she has. And and there is that level of comparison. There is some, the difference. Yeah. The difference is you're not actually trading actual cards or items. Right. And of course, the the Gloomhaven uh, communication restrictions well, yes. are a big are a big uh, sort of hindrance mm -hmm. um, and and limitation to that cooperation. But also, again, you know, Gloomhaven is again a more condensed world, and opening up that cooperation would almost just make it too easy. Yeah. Um, and you don't have the expanded universe mm -hmm. to work within, and, and that's why uh, Isaac, I think, is in invoked some of those restrictions on yeah. characters that don't exist in Pathfinder. But I think the puzzle solving similarities yeah. uh, are in many ways really quite similar. Yeah. I, I, the more you talk about, the more I'm starting to agree. <laughs> There's definitely differences. They, they feel very, I think it's just the feel, right? Like well, again, I don't feel like a playing level of, similar That game. level of cooperation yeah. um, and, and the free moving information and items is yeah. a massive difference. But again, it's because of that, you know, the, the restricted environment in Gloomhaven mm -hmm. versus the unrestricted world yep. of Pathfinder. Yeah, and to be honest, what the game actually recommends is play with your cards face up oh, wow. in this case. Like, you're allowed to share any information, so why not? Yeah, and all our first it's not few like games like you don't know what you, the person standing next to you is holding. Exactly. <laughs> Although if they're at a distant location, that'd be an interesting metagame. If you're at a distant location, Flip you have it to over. have your cards yeah. in your hand. It's a cool way to do it. All right, I do have a complaint about the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Uh, it's something worse than the learning curve. And this isn't mainly because this isn't going to go away. Uh, the, the learning curve, once you've learned to play the game, isn't a problem anymore. Uh, the size of font they use on these cards. Like these cards, uh, for anyone who's seen the unboxing video, seen this, or you can Google it and look at the cards in this game, they have the most text I have ever seen put on a single playing card size card. Like there is a ridiculous amount. There are full paragraphs of text, not one paragraph, multiple paragraphs of text squeezed onto these cards. And to get it all to fit, they used a small font, a font that drives me nuts. Like uh, just the other thing too, is the amount of text on every card means you're probably not going to memorize those. Like there's a lot of text on most Magic the Gathering cards, but eventually you're going to wreck you like, oh, that's a whatever, a send your vampire. I know what that does. And you're going to learn it. There's 440 cards in here, each with three paragraphs of text. Like, I, I'm sure, like over time, you're probably going to learn the cards in your deck and maybe some of the cards in your opponent's deck, but there's just too much to memorize. We're at the point now where to play this game, we have a magnifying glass at the table. Like, this is beyond me taking my glasses off. This is, I need something to make the cards bigger. Yeah. Well, we're old, eyes fail, and sadly, short of skimping on card art, I doubt that there's anything they could really do about it. I guess. I don't know. Maybe tarot size cards, but then I guess the game would cost more. I just, well, your box size old. would get, uh, <laughs> yeah. 440 tarot cards in a, is a big box to deal That's with. That's true. That is a big box. It'd be a tall box. I would still be smart and gloomy even. <laughs> Yeah, overall, I, I think you probably tell, I, I'm extremely impressed by this game. 
Uh, this was my first experience. I did not play the original game. I didn't start playing it in 2013. Um, despite a significant learning curve, I, it, it's definitely there. This is not a quick, easy to read. Let's sit down, get the game, crack it out tonight. We're going to play tonight. Oh no, you're, you're going to have to spend at least a day or two reading ahead of time. And then you got to teach your friends and then keep that rule book handy. Um, I've enjoyed every play we've had, uh, even when we failed. Like this is this is a game that's like pandemic when you fail and it's close. It's like, oh, we're so close. Let's try again. Um, the adventure path's been fun. Uh, it's been entertaining. The story is pretty good. They've done some really neat stuff using the mechanics that I don't want to spoil, but just like interesting ways to represent like NPCs traveling with you and stuff. They've done some cool stuff. Um, card game really does give you some of the feel of playing through a Pathfinder adventure. But you don't have to have a game master, a full role playing group, and uh, no one needs to do any prep, and you don't have to draw maps, and you're not uh, all the stuff that has to have to happen to play a role playing session. You don't need all that. You can get that experience with just this box set. If you're a fan of Pathfinder, I, I think there's a lot to like in this card game. No, it's not going to feel like playing through a full role playing game adventure path, but it does let you experience the Pathfinder world in another way. If you dig adventure games in general, I think you're going to find a lot to like here. This is a very different take on fantasy adventuring than saying a dungeon crawling game, like especially a Descent, but even a Gloomhaven. There's no positioning here. There's no map. There's no hexes. There's no line of sight. You don't get that aspect of the game at all. This is all about managing your items and trying to mitigate the dice, trying to make sure that you have a nice dice in your pool, that your odds are good, you're going to succeed. And what's interesting is you're looking at dice pools here, so you're not looking at the usual linear curve that you see in most role-playing games. You're not just rolling 1d20, you're rolling 2d6 and a bonus d4 and a d8 and doubling the d8 because of a blessing. Like, it's a, it's a much different system, and you can do the odds in your head a lot better. For anyone checking this game out, though, realize it's not a deck building game. This is not a clank or anything like that, right? This is not a game where you're just going to keep improving your deck and your deck's going to get huge and by the end of the game and have this massive awesome deck. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's much more of a slower progression, more like a role-playing game. This is a campaign game where deck improvements are going to happen between adventures mainly. Sure, you're going to find a couple things, but you may not even want them, like a role-playing adventure. You may not find the gear you want, but now and then you find that sweet magic sword that just makes your character better from that point going forward. What I do strongly suggest, which I wish I had, was someone else to teach me the game. So if you can find that, that's your added bonus. This is not the easiest game to learn uh, from reading the rule book. It's like reading a technical manual. But if you can't find a teacher, I do think it's worth the effort. Excellent. Um, now, here's one thing I wasn't clear on when I was looking through this. Are the paths from earlier... So if, if I, uh, uh, compatible. So if I buy the 2019 box set, am I going to get something out of buying a path that came out in 2018? So they did change the way things work significantly for the adventure pass. So the previous adventure pass were a one large oversized card and it had a list of what you encountered on encounter one. And it just basically told you how to build the decks, how, what villains to use, what, whatever. And you would check it off when you beat it. And then there'd be part two, part three, part four with rewards. That's been replaced by a like a mo a D and D module, like a book. It's it's a right. small book, but it's a book that tells here's your story and here's what's happening. And there's more to it. There's more involved. So yes, the old ones are still playable, but you're not going to get the same experience as you will with the new one. Right. And I I think you'd have to enjoy this a lot to want to go backwards, in my opinion. Like it, everything I've seen now. Again, I haven't played the old sets, but I did. I've watched some how to play videos. Interestingly, there is not a single how to play video for the new set out there on anywhere on the web, which I thought was odd. There's lots of the old set and watching it. There are differences. There are rule changes. There's sections of this rule book that tell you what's different so you can do it. And the old stuff is all compatible, but there are little tweaks and little differences. Uh, blessings work completely different. The clock's completely different. You no longer have an adventure path card. Like they don't exist at all. You now again have a book. It, it, it's, I think there's enough here. Plus there is another full adventure path already out, which I have, yep. which if we ever finish Dragon's <laughs> Demand, we're also going to review. There's an unboxing video of you if you want to just see how many cards are in there, because there's not really a lot to unbox. There's a book and a bunch of cards. Um, 
I don't see why you go backwards personally, but you if, if you really love this game and you're really enjoying it, there is more content out there. I think one of my favorite pieces of content that I found showing just how much love players have for this game <laughs> is the player mats, which are oh, yeah. basically fancy mouse pads, really. I mean, they aren't mm-hmm. these aren't fan, really super fancy, but they actually come with a rule, whereas if you are using your uh, player mat, your pro- the proper player mat, you get an extra um, refresh of a card. Oh, um, okay. Just just because you've you, you made know, it up and, and bought your <laughs> bought the player mats. That's pretty cool. That is one thing that is not compatible. So this is important. There was a board you could buy for the first edition, and there was a mat you could buy, and I've seen it at cons. That's not completely compatible anymore mm. because of the way they changed. Because location cards used to be lo- larger as well. Okay. So like it has a spot to put your campaign card, your your adventure path card, and a spot to put your location cards, and then the other decks go below it, making basically like a big snowflake. The game no longer plays like that. Now you just have a bunch of set decks in front of you. All of the cards are standard playing card size now. There are no oversized cards. Like they kind of change that. Like you could get the map, but it's gonna have a bunch of squares on it you won't use, which is kind of the opposite of what you want to play map for. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah, these and they haven't these put one out for mats, the so I'm not sure. And they are so still and they are still shown on the Paizo website, which is where I found them. So I'm thinking those are probably individual player mats, yeah. As opposed to this is like your central board, right. your your central the the locations, right? So again, you're gonna have number of players plus one locations every game. So playing two player, we always have three locations up. Right. And if you have more players, you would build a bigger circle. All right. Well, for a somewhat more in-depth look at the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core Set 2019 Edition, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right. Despite the fact it's been three weeks since we were last together, we didn't get a lot of gaming in. Uh, we're far too busy shilling deals for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. We did get in some games, though, starting with a two-player game of Harry Potter House Cup competition. Uh, we first shared that game on our live stream during Extra Life. This is our second play of the game with just Deanna and I. Um, I got to say, it plays really well with only two players. And the well, I haven't played the game a lot, but every time I play it, I'm like, wow, there's more going on here than I thought. Now, I will say, I still think it's a great gateway game. Like the, the mechanics here are dead simple. Like you are just placing a student somewhere and getting what it shows on the board next to it, trying to collect sets of stuff to complete goals. Like that's it. That's pretty much it. But man, it's that, that I'm trying to figure out how to maximize that turn that can be quite brain burning and AP filled. Like uh, there's some analysis paralysis. I wouldn't necessarily say problems in this game, But for what seems like a light worker placement Harry Potter game, there's a lot more thinking that can be involved. Now, I do have a few complaints about the iconography in the game. Um, Part of it is the way potions look versus Defense of the Dark Arts look way too similar on the cards. We brought that up during the live stream. And while another one, which we ended up realizing the last time we played, we had played our first two games extreme. There is a type of iconography that I thought meant player count. So there's these location cards that show like a three on them. And I thought it was for three players only and they go up to four and it's a four player game. And there's some that only say two. And I'm like, so these are the cards you include with two players. These are cards you include with three and these are cards you include with four. Well, that's not what that iconography meant. It actually meant you needed a student at a level. So a level four student who has at least one skill at level four. Now this didn't break the game. So our plays we played aren't invalidated. But it did mean that I pulled some locations out of the deck that could have been in there that could have come up. But you randomize which locations are in play. So it's a chance they might not have come up anyway. So we did play Slightly Extreme. Uh, It's going to be a few more plays before I'm ready for a final review on this one, especially having cards out with locations that require skill levels. Yeah, that's twice the iconography has come up as a problem in this game. And I I fully expect that we're going to hear about it in the review. Yeah, that's not going to fix itself. Uh, unless Deanna actually does steal the cards and take a paint marker to them like she's talking about. <laughs> but that's not going to improve anything from the original production quality. I do still got to give it the thumbs up for the best scoring mechanism ever in a board game. I, I still love the way you track score in that game. Up next, I got something brand new, something totally new. Uh, it's called a game called Bricks and Brutes. 
Uh, this was again two player, just Deanna and I. Uh, now this is a kids game. This is a I, I have a review copy sent by the designer. Um, people who watched our last live show actually got to see me open this up during the after show. Um, this is a lighter game. It's a non dexterity based stacking game. So like you're stacking blocks, but if your stuff falls over, just restack it, right? Like you're, you're not rewiring on your skill. Um, you're trying to build a section of a castle wall that looks the way a certain card does. You're trying to meet the queen specifications before any other player finishes their own. Uh, this is a very random game. It's all about you roll a die, you get some bricks, you get some workers, you build some stuff and try to do it before the other players. Uh, it's got some backstabbing elements. Um, this is definitely a younger kids game. The only reason Deanna and I played was to get the rules down before we introduced it to the kids. Um, this isn't really enough that's going to, no gamer is going to rush out to play this, but it might be a great game for kids. It does have some really cool components and it does have a couple mechanics that are fun. Like one of them is your brute meeples. When they fight the other brute meeples, you roll them. And the ones that are face up are in the fight. And the ones that are face down were, were knocked out. And if they happen to land standing up, there were two brutes. Like that's a, that's a neat little mechanic. It looks cute. Yeah, this was a fun one to see pop up on your Twitter feed because it's just a cool looking game. Yeah, this one definitely wins for table presence, if nothing else. I got to admit, when I first saw it, I thought it was going to be more crossbows and catapults. Like I thought you were going to build the wall and put meeple on it and try to knock it down. No, not at all. Now, that might be a neat expansion. Just saying you might want to do something more with the game. But yeah, it looks good. I, I think the kids are going to like it. I'm going to think uh, Big G's probably a little too old for this one, but we'll see. Next is another new to us game. Um, sort of. I technically played it a long time ago at a board game blitz tournament, but the first time I played my copy of Mission Planet. Uh, this is off my pile of shame. This is one I've been trying to get to the table for a long time, mainly to show off to Deanna. We've mentioned this one on the show. Anytime we talk about area control or area majority, I bring this game up. Now, we played this with uh, my oldest daughter, Deanna's mom, Deanna and I, so all four of us playing it. This is one of the purest area majority games on the market. You, Everyone starts with a hand of identical cards. You're going to use those to load steampunk rocketeers onto ships. And then when the ships are full, they're going to fly to Mars and go to different sections on Mars where they're going to compete for three resources of varying qualities. There's a, a not so great one, a great one, and, a, and an awesome one. Only the player who has the most astronauts on each region of Mars is going to get the mining rights and score points. This is a great older Avalon Hill game, an old bookcase style game that Fantasy Flight reprinted. Not new, we're still looking at like 2016 for the reprint. Uh, but they upgraded it, made it look better. They gave it a they they gave it that steampunky rocket punk theme, included little tiny astronaut miniatures, really great looking game. And I was really happy that everyone liked it. Like Deanna's mom liked it, Deanna was really impressed and uh, my oldest daughter actually really enjoyed it and did really well, which I was surprised. Having never played a game like you had role selection combined with area control, I am really looking forward to playing this one more. I don't know if we'll ever do a formal review that on this one. This isn't uh, any obligation or anything like this. It's a classic game that most people have already played already. But the main thing for me is this still stands. Like whenever we talk about area control, I'm going to keep talking about this game. The Mission Red Planet is just a great game. Now, one thing about Red Planet is that it's a take that game as well. Yes, not a not oh, a yeah. family friendly game. <laughs> oh no, this is this is area control, right? This is I'm trying to get this spot from you, and there is a card. Uh, one of them is the saboteur, where you're going to blow up one of the other rockets before it leaves Mars or leaves Earth to fly to Mars. So that's going to kill a bunch of people with asteroids. Um, there's a femme fatale that lets you convert one of the players to the other sides. This is very much a fight over squares on or fight over sections of Mars. This is not a happy, let's go colonize Mars, like uh, more cutthroat than say terraforming Mars, but way, way lighter. This is a gateway level game. Now, over the last three weeks, we did get in some other plays of other games. Um, Tyrants of the Underdark, for example, in preparation for today's review, uh, mainly just to make sure I didn't forget any of the rules ahead of time and to confirm it's a great game, um, including a number of game plays on Board Game Arena. Uh, quite a few of those actually, but being stuck at home. And it's one of the few things I could do um, while dealing with deals is I could jump on there now and then take a couple turns. Um, what I do want to call out out of all those, though, is a wonderful game of the crew we had on Sunday night with one of our patrons, uh, the awesome Evil John. Uh, we John had never played the game before. Deanna Schott and I have a bit of experience with it playing it online. We started it on and went all the way to mid 17 before calling it a night. 
And I got to say, the crew is such a good game. It's just, man, like, like it, it's blowing me away by just how good this trick-taking game is. Though, if you are playing online, play real time. Do not even attempt. Like, we should just cancel that game. Like, I don't even know if I want to keep it going. Like, I'm, I'm sick of seeing pop it pop up as a take your turn. And it's been a week, and I don't know what's going on or who's trying to do what. And if anyone's communicated, ah, no, real time only. Yep. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So the big thing going on right now uh, for me is we need to do some unboxings. Like three weeks went by, right? And packages have started to pile up. Stuff that I've asked for review copies and 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 stuff companies have sent. And uh, part of it was uh, the, the pandemic, right? Delayed everything. And it seems like it all showed up in the last three weeks. Plus before that, I already had a pile of stuff, right? Like Wonder Woman showed up and I got some stuff from Ravensburger. Like there's already, like there's just all this stuff showing up. Um, there was a box insert I was going to build that I haven't gotten to yet. So um, for those of you in the chat, stick around. I got four things to open uh, once we get to the after show tonight. So there's, there's all this stuff, right, um, that I want to unbox. And added to that, our next upgrade for the podcast and our live shows and our live streams and our unboxings has showed up, which is a new 4K camera. So that is something to look forward to. And I am looking forward to producing our best looking unboxing videos yet with a 4K camera on me, probably, and this camera pointing down, doing the whole transparent thing. So I am looking forward to that. I think that's going to be some great looking unboxing videos. As for playing games, uh, well, assuming we get those unboxings done, I'm looking forward to checking out Not Dice in particular. That one looks really cool. It's sitting right here in front of me here. And while uh, Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons is a big one I'm looking forward to, people keep asking me. I keep sharing deals on it. And like, how is this game? I'm like, oh, I've heard it's good. I want to try it. It's right there. And that Bricks and Brutes, um, now that we know how to play, I do want to try it out with the kids. So it's going to be going to be uh, uh, trying to work on the pile of obligation in multiple ways, I think. Even though I was pushing to try to get some of the stuff off the pile of shame, but I think we got to shift focus back to <laughs> obligation for a little bit. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to our uh, some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. First off, welcome Brian Shine, our latest patron. David Milner Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz, thanks as always, Brian. You will, Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss managed to make it into the chat. Still playing Alien? Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our, our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts and great things like new 4K cameras, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.